even as someone who is white and male and straight, you know, I've got all the conventional privileges. It's something which is becoming more and more aware of. And it is something which I care deeply about. But honestly, do I know much about? Not really. And that's why I thought rather than get someone like myself who is passionate, but not necessarily informed, that's why we'll get Zara. I'm going to quickly pass you on to Zoe, who will introduce a bit more about divergent thinking and then introduce Zara, and then we'll uh, get on our way. So Zoe, without further delay, up to you. Um, hi guys, uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our Overcoming Racism Through Social Action Workshop. Um, I just want to say it's amazing to see so many of you guys taking the time out of your weekend um, to attend. So we really, um, we really appreciate that. Um, before we dive into the session, I just want to introduce myself and Divergent Thinking. So I'm Zoe and I co-run Divergent Thinking um, with Nat, our founder. So Divergent Thinking is basically a platform where we provide a diverse range of workshops that focuses on harnessing um, our different ways of thinking and improving our leadership skills. Um, and during lockdown, uh, we wanted to find a way to give back to the community. So we created this free webinar series um, and this, work, this webinar is part of that. Um, focusing on self-development and self-care. Uh, we've done previous webinars as part of this series, such as public speaking, emotional intelligence, uh, yoga, um, and mobile video making, which has been incredibly fun to do. So moving back to the session we're doing today, uh, we, we're very lucky to have Zara here today, who will be delivering the session. She is an incredible writer and YouTuber, which has half a decade experience working in the charity sector, um, helping young people, and is a passionate advocate towards social justice. So, um, and I would say out of all the sessions we've done, I am very, really excited for this one, not only because it's quite personal to me, but it's incredibly relevant today. And I just want to touch upon, I mean, you can't talk about this without talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, which I just want to touch upon very quickly. Um, I just think it's so refreshing and uplifting to see the international community come together in defiance against systematic and structural racism through social action. Um, and demanding human dignity and liberty worldwide. And I think it's really important for us at Divergent Thinking to continue this conversation um, through, through this workshop. So um, that's enough talking from me. Um, do stick around after the workshop where we will we'll do a quick Q&A with Nat. And I'll also touch upon a uh, funding opportunity for young people if they do want to start a social action project. Um, so I'll let Zara take it from here um, to begin the workshop. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so I'm just going to actually uh, share my screen with you so that I can share a PowerPoint. So hopefully you can see um, my PowerPoint. Um, so uh, just a little introduction from me, um, my name is Zara uh, and I work for, um, I work for a, a London University as a digital specialist but prior to that I have um, about five, six years experience in the charity sector, working in the charity sector and working with people doing social action campaigns is something that has completely changed my life, it's made me feel um, so inspired where, where I think that it's very hard to be inspired, especially during these times. Um, and I think also it'll be interesting to see how familiar everyone is with, I know everyone's here because they feel passionate about racism, um, but can I just get um, a little feel for how, how passionate are people about um, social action? Does, that, does everyone know what social action is? Can I just get um, a little, uh, just in the chat, if you could just let me know what, what are your thoughts about social action? 
Do you know what it is? Do you have no idea? Are you here to find out? Just be good to kind of gauge where everyone is at with that. Find out more about being proactive. Brilliant, Laura. Good to find out a lot about social action. Hey, Thadia, nice to see you. Uh, Bradley, um, know what it is, but I think I could do more. Okay. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, well then that makes this quite exciting um, because we can kind of uh, go into it quite deeply. Um, so I am gonna share my screen with you now. Okay, so uh, let's kick off. So as, as we mentioned already, as Zoe mentioned, as Nat mentioned, uh, we're gonna be talking about overcoming racism through social action. But I just want to point out, um, we're not going to be able to do, we're not going to be able to eradicate racism solely through social action. Um, and I will go into why, but I think a lot of people here already know why, uh, because racism isn't a grassroots problem. Racism is something that is systemic, it's structural, it's embedded into so many of the systems that we use today. So therefore, it's not going to be possible to get rid of it through social action. But I hope by the end of today, um, we can start to kind of figure out what we, the things that we can do and the power that we do have. So to kick off, I want to tell you, I want to tell you two stories. So the first story, um, I was 15 years old uh, and I was in the high street with my mum and she walked into a shop and I was tired. So I sat on a bench outside the shop and after a couple of moments, an older, an older white lady um, sat at the end of the bench um, and she was quiet for a little bit. And then she, out of nowhere, she said, um, it's just not right. Uh, people coming here and taking our jobs. And I didn't really interact with her because I kind of knew what she was saying. Um, and then she went on to say, my granddaughter has to pay seven grand for law school, but you will probably get it for free. So that's the first, that's the first story. Um, the second time, second story is when I was working, uh, this was my second full-time job after, <clears throat> this is my second full-time job um, after graduating from my BA. And I was working at an education charity, which primarily focused on diversity. So that was the focus of this charity. Um, and we went out for like a social meal um, and everyone was drinking apart from me. And um, one of the senior members of staff uh, turned to me and said, oh, I hope you don't find this rude, but are you expected to have an arranged marriage? And her defense, she was, she was tipsy and, and we were talking about weddings, so maybe this made sense to her at the time. Um, but that, nonetheless, that is what happened. So I want you to keep these two stories in mind for now. So what is what is racism? So the definition of racism is prejudice, discrimination or antagonism directed at a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular, particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. So when we think about racism, we can kind of differentiate experiences, I suppose, to personal and systemic experiences. So personal is probably not the right word, um, but that's how I'm gonna distinguish it for now. If anyone has any better ideas, put, put that in the chat and I will take a look at that. Um, so for personal experiences, um, and I just gave you two examples of these. Um, these are the ones that we kind of latch onto. These are the ones that we, we don't mind listening to um, because they target heartstrings, um, they elicit emotion um, because stories are how we empathize. And also in those two stories, it's very clear who the baddie in that story was. And having a story where we clearly know who is in the wrong makes it easier for us to kind of move on because we can say, okay, we would never do that kind of behavior and we can move on from that. However, it is harder when it comes to systemic racism. So systemic racism is um, institutions, it kind of means that the institutions and the systems that we have no choice but to align ourselves with are inherently racist. 
Um, and by that, I mean, even if no one person uh, consciously had any racist or racial like inclination, um, the system is still designed to benefit um, white people uh, and be a disadvantage to people of color. Now, unsurprisingly, with systemic racism, it often leaves people feeling powerless or guilty, um, as though they're complicit in it, which means that we tend to switch off when we, when we talk about systemic racism. Let me break this down further and give you some examples. So, the first example is person A is white and married to person B who is South Asian. Though person A has tolerance of all that person B does, cultures, traditions and family customs, Person A has found it very easy to get a job straight out of university and has managed to progress in the role after being there for six months. Person B, meanwhile, is unemployed. After a while, person A starts to doubt person B and thinks they are lazy. After all, person A managed to progress. What's so difficult about it? This, so this is, this is one thing I kind of want to, I want to unpick in a second as well. Um, Example two, person A is allowed into restaurants and given a seat immediately, whilst person B is made to wait for an over an hour. Person A assumes that it's person B's behavior that is causing this. So these two examples um, are, they are a little bit harder to empathize with, especially if you've never dealt with racism, because there's no one clear bad person. Yeah, I'm sure that we can say, oh, but it was that particular company, but it was that particular restaurant, but actually, it is a system and it is a pattern and it happens every day. So what systemic racism ultimately does, as well as continuing to continuing in a cycle of inequality that has persisted for generations, is it, it drives a wedge between people that deal with it and people that don't. And if you've never dealt with it, it can be very hard to understand. Um, and it also makes way for gaslighting. And gaslighting, if anyone that doesn't know what it is, is manipulating someone by psychological means into doubting their own sanity. And this can take so many forms, but mostly it goes against, it goes against a myth that all working class people um, live by knowingly uh, and subconsciously, which is that hard work always pays off. This is not always the case. Uh, as Akala says in a panel interview that he did, I think around 2008, 2009, Racism didn't start from the bottom up, it started from the top down. Usually when we think of racism, we think of the working class, um, which is quite a negative connotation to make. Um, and a lot of the time we demonize the working class for that reason. Um, when, again, racism didn't start from the bottom up, it started from the top down. These systems, um, usually someone that we would paint as a racist, they're not, they're just kind of um, a victim of the system in their own way. So does hard, hard work really pay off? This is a quote um, from a Guardian article by Hashim Mohammed, who is a barrister. And he said, the reality is that most of us try hard to do better, but may be lacking the environment to fully realize our potential. Real success often boils down to luck, sustained stability, the right teachers at the right time, and even not experiencing moments of grief at crucial junctures. So this is, so this is kind of, it's very hard to train ourselves to believe that actually people are not at fault for their situations. It's very hard to kind of get our heads around that because we like to think that we have agency over everything. Um, so this brings me on to the locus of control. Um, so with locus of control, there's kind of two spectrums. There's an internal locus of control and an external locus of control. So when you have them, so it's like a, it's a spectrum. So if you have a completely internal lo locus of control, you have control of the things around you, you are confident when things change um, and you don't, it doesn't panic you, um, and you believe that you create your future. An external locus of control means that you have, you feel like you have little to no control of anything and that luck and random chance are the source of any success. So Internal is I control my own destiny and external is others control my destiny. Now, the issue with this is that it can be weaponized towards people of color, as we saw with gaslighting. So, for example, somebody saying, if you really wanted a job, you would have a job. 
or the one that is never okay and the one that we've actually seen on TV very recently is if you don't like it, then why don't you just leave? It's not, it's not a, um, that's not a possibility. This is, if you're, if you're British and this is your country or even if you've lived here, if you've sought asylum here, this is your home. Leaving is not an option, um, but we'll, we, can, we can discuss that later. Um, but what's important to distinguish, distinguish with locus of control um, is that there are some things that we can change, there are some things we can influence, and there are some things out of our control. What we want is to have a very internal locus of control for the things that we can change, to be aware of the things that we can influence, and to actually let go of things that are maybe not within our remit. Um, and the reason for that is because it's when we think, okay, we have agency, we have control, we can be empowered um, over certain things. It's, it's so much better for our own mental well-being because if we have an external locus of control for everything, then we would, just, we would feel hopeless and this would, this would give way to feelings of it could even um, exacerbate things like depression um, and really exacerbate a negative mental well-being as well. So it's important to make sure that we can distinguish between the, the different the circle of control, circle of influence and things outside of that. So what I want to point out next is um, very kind of entwined with this is the proactive model. Um, so whatever happens in our life, we have a stimulus. So this will be something that happens to us. It could be um, an action someone takes towards us. It could be something that someone says to us, um, something that is said about us. Um, and this will elicit a response. So the stimulus, ha something happens and we respond to it. This, is, this happens day to day, this, this is happening all the time. You might hear a noise outside while you're sleeping and you wake up. The stimulus is the noise, the response is that you wake up. But what we disregard in a lot of situations um, is the freedom to choose. Now this, when I first read this, I thought, okay, this is a bit patronizing. Of course, I know I have the freedom to choose. However, when we actually break this down and think about what comes into the freedom to choose, it's self-awareness, imagination, independent, independent will and conscience. All of these four things go into that freedom to choose. When so, when, so when something happens to us, undermining this freedom, undermining all of these four things means that we're not getting the best out of ourselves and we're not fulfilling our potential. Dr. Stephen Covey, this is, so this is from a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey. Um, and one of the quotes is, we have the initiative and the responsibility to make things happen. So I want you to kind of, I want you to kind of keep this in mind and I want you to, to use this to, to kind of feel motivated. Um, because I think, I think it's very important to stay motivated, especially um, when horrible things are happening around the world and people are being killed just on the basis of their skin colour, we have to believe that there is something that we can do. We have to believe that. And this, just, this isn't just for people of colour, this is for all of us. We all have a responsibility to eradicate racism. And on, on that as well, I think a lot of the times when you deal with racism, uh, especially as a child, your parents have that talk with you. And I know for black children, it's different. It's different for black children. It's different for Asian children. Um, but I think particularly for black children, I've been I've been seeing so many stories online where kids have been they've been they've been children. They've been kids, and their parents have had to say to them, when the police ask you to do something, just do it. Don't cause a fight. Don't have an argument. Now I've never had that talk, and I have that privilege of. I've, I've had that privilege of never having to be scared. Uh, but, and that is, because, that is because I don't have the issues that come with being black. And I think it's, it's, it's really important that we acknowledge our privilege in all of these situations. Because just because we haven't dealt with something doesn't mean it's not a problem. And when you tell someone it's not a problem, you're undermining and you're invalidating their experience, which is, which is effectively gaslighting um, which has been done to people of colour for generations and generations. And it's definitely a cycle we need to come out of. So with this proactive model and with this freedom to choose, um, this is where social action comes in. So social action is people coming together to tackle an issue, 
support other people or improve their local area. And it involves people giving up their time and other resources for the common good. So this could be volunteering, to helping out with community owned services, to um, peer networks, to community organizing. So it's all about people coming together um, because they have this shared goal in mind. Now, again, and I've said this before, but in a perfect society, social action wouldn't exist. Social action isn't about being positive. It's not about this, this whole kind of toxic positivity, like, oh, but, you know, but everything is okay and that we can do stuff. It's about seeing and addressing the issues and addressing the problem in society. And, and for, for black people dealing with racism every day, um, and for people of color that deal with racism every day, it's, it's not okay to force them to engage and to force them to be positive. That's not something that we should be doing. Um, it's not possible um, and it's not helpful. Uh, and I, I wouldn't even say it's about looking on the bright side. Um, social action exists because we all see a problem, whether we're white, whether we're black, whether we're Asian, it's about seeing that issue and seeing that problem. So the question to ask yourself is, what do you want to change? And what experience do you have that can, that can start to tackle it? And I'll break this down a little bit further. Um, if you have even a half answer to either of these questions, it means that you have power and you could literally start your campaign tomorrow. Now, one campaign that you run is not going to end all racism. Racism is not gonna end overnight. It's not, it's not gonna happen through a grassroots movement. I think it could definitely help, um, but, it, but it isn't gonna do it. But what it can do is start to chip away. And because it's about chipping away, the more you can hone in on the specific issue, the more concise you can be. Um, a lot of the time, this means that the bigger the difference you can make. So really kind of hone in on the exact problem that you want to face. It's not about, about saying the problem I want to face is racism. It's about looking at something very specific. So examples could be getting more um, BAME women into STEM. BAME, as we, we've been talking about, um, BAME means black and Asian minority ethnic uh, and it is a collective term used by the government to refer to the ethnic minority population. Um, I don't think it's a very helpful term. I think someone mentioned earlier that it actually means that it, it, it's as though that all of these people deal with the same problems and they don't. Um, so, and it, this actually includes um, the white ethnic minority population as well. So it's basically putting all of these people into one umbrella term and thinking that they will deal with the same with the same um, challenges every day and it's it's not the case at all so that is something that does need to start to change and i would like to talk to you a little bit about that afterwards um so so yeah so it could be getting more bame women into stem it could be increasing the aspirations of young black artists um or it could be about self-care and mental well-being for people of color so when it comes to um, building a campaign and measuring an impact um, when I've been in social action char charities, we like to use this metaphor of a tree. Um, so the trunk is your main idea. And this could be a writing group to help the AME women express ideas about mental health. The branches are your people. Now the volunteers and the people and the participants are the most important part of a campaign. Anyone that tells you otherwise is, is lying to you. The people that you meet and the people that benefit from your campaign Will, will make it all worth it. The leaves are the resources. So um, is your campaign gonna be solely digital? Is it gonna have a face-to-face -face element? And if so, are you gonna have a Facebook page, a website, or a tangible place to meet? This could refer to other materials as well. And the fruit is the impact. So I want to actually ask, um, what could be the impact? I'm just going to come out of this um, and I just want to look at the chat for a second. So what, what do we think about, what do we think could be the impact of this, of this BAME campaign? Just, just type it in anything. There's no wrong answers. So what could be some positive impact that comes out of, putting together a writing group for BAME women to talk about mental health. 
what could be a, an impact of that? Related to empathy, feeling of community, brilliant. Heightened awareness and understanding. Yep. Yep, realizing that others have some experiences. Empowerment. Yep, very good. I'm just going to go back to my shiny mullings. Uh, so my shiny said, I often feel frustrated with my freedom to choose. Sometimes we know something goes wrong, re our reaction can make it worse. For example, um, someone says something insensitive and I call it out, I may be gaslighted as the angry black woman. Um, yeah, um, I, I think this is such, it's, this is so crucial. I'm so glad you said that, my shiny. Um, so many times black women are, black women solely, and I'm going to focus on saying that, um, because I don't think any other group has that same kind of um, being being tarred with that brush of the angry black woman. It's so unhelpful because what it does is it undermines it undermines your frustrations that are that are so valid. Um, and and the issue with with is that we look at racism as a people of color problem. We look at it as people of color teach your kids to be aware of racism when actually. That isn't the way to be. That isn't the way to be doing it. We should be teaching all of our kids, um, especially especially if you're from a white background. You should be talking to your kids about racism. You should be talking about why it's wrong. Um, a lot of parents are saying things like, "Oh, it's not fair to expose kids to racism at such a young age." Um, people of color have to deal with it all the time. Um, I'm pretty sure the first time, um, the first time, everyone I know, the first time they dealt with racism was when they were in primary school. Um, is that okay for, for, for a child to, to deal with that um, at such a young age? No, I don't think it is. Um, so Marshani, I think your, your, feelings are, your feelings of frustration are, um, are shared uh, with so many people. And I think this is why um, it's, it takes so much more than one campaign and one social action campaign to actually um, to, to feel better about things um, and that's why we need to educate ourselves on things like um, on things like gaslighting on things like white privilege on things like white exceptionalism and so on um, and I just want to kind of um, I want to I wanted to um, put out there does anyone know what white exceptionalism means can you can you just type into the network I know I'm asking loads of questions but I think it would be interesting i am i am yeah um well i think sorry no i think sorry yeah nicole could you um maybe put it in the uh, chat box um yeah i think it's it's very similar to that abla i'm nice to see you abla good to see you Remember you from Team B. Um, Alex, Alex said, I'm white and no one ever talked to me when I was a kid. I was accidentally rude at primary school, having no idea. I felt betrayed by the adults in my life. That's a, that's a, very, um, that is a very good point as well. I think, I think you're doing, <laughs> we're doing uh, white children a disservice by not talking to them. Because a lot of the time, they, they don't know how to step and it, and it becomes very uncomfortable. Um, and I would say, um, I would say um, watch, uh, there's, a, there's a program on Channel 4 at the moment, it's called, yeah, thank you, Jaina. <laughs> thank you so much. It's called the School That Tried to Tackle Racism. It's literally a school that's around the corner from me. One of my friends is a teacher there. And um, I think it's great. But if you look at the comments on YouTube, people are angry. People are terrified of stuff like this happening, which shows that we have such a long way to go such a long way to go in this country. If anyone thinks that racism isn't alive and well in the UK, um, there's definitely a problem. Um, so yeah, no, I would definitely highly suggest that. And I think um, watching things like that, lobbying lo local government and all of that kind of stuff, um, I, think it's, I think it's really important. And we 100% we need to come away from these negative stuff. So as Sally said, um, the um, angry black woman and the lazy African stereotype, things like that, um we need to we need to come with it's, it's not helpful it's it's so damaging and we've got generations of uh of, and it's generational trauma as well imagine being painted as a stereotype for everything that you had to say um i think this is where we need a greater level of empathy from people that aren't black 
hundred percent from people that aren't black. I'm, I'm talking about Asian people. I'm talking about Arab people. There is anti-blackness. Anti-blackness pervades everything. So we need to educate ourselves on that so so much. Um, white exceptionalism might feel normalized, so it doesn't seem like a big deal. Anita, yep, very good, brilliant. Um, they aren't taught what racism means. I tried to call it out, but they just get offended at being called racist. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, there is so, there's so much, um, and I think this is this comes under the bracket of white fragility. Um, when people are called racist, they can't handle it. They literally cannot handle it. To, to them, that's the worst thing they can they can be called. Not realizing it's actually probably worse to be dealing with racism. Um, so, I would definitely say we need to. Um, we, we need to be uh, talking. We need to be talking about that a lot more. So, if we go back to um, white exceptionalism, white exceptionalism is so. If someone calls you out in a racist way and you turn around and say, "No, but I'm not racist. I'm the least racist person ever," not helpful. If someone has taken what you have said as racist, it's about looking internally and saying, "Okay, I need to address what I said," because I mean, there's no shame or blame in growing and learning and being a better person. We, we all have to learn. Um, but being defensive and thinking there's not a problem is, is the opposite. You're not learning. You're purposely choosing to be ignorant. So it's about if someone calls you out, accept it. Accept that they're calling you out and educate yourself. That's the only way that we're going to learn. Um, Fadia said what is brilliant is starting to see the commentary come from not black, black people more openly. Um, brilliant. We have white people educating other white people at work because people listen to their peers more. Very good. Yep. I, I'm happy to be seeing that as well. Um, yes. Oh my God, Janet. Validating it by knowing a minority is an excuse. That is the classic. Oh, but I have, but I have black friends. Yeah, no, hundred percent. You can still be racist and have black friends. Um, sometimes it's not just racism, it's ignorance and microaggressions that they don't know is racist. As long as you learn to accept from it, it's all right. Not being able to accept why it gets more heated. Yes, de definitely, Anita. I think when people can stop being defensive, we can start having a lot more open conversations. Um, if someone, when I was at school, um, Abba said, when I was at school, people made jokes about my hair. If I hit back with a blonde joke, I was hair. See, yeah, I think this is the thing as well. I think, a lot of people, there's so much talk about saying, uh, I've, I've had so many white people say, oh, but white people are gonna become the minority soon. Why is that so scary? Are you, are you scared of being treated like a minority <laughs> because of the way that minorities have been treated? And if that's the case, then let's work together to change it. Uh, Danny said, can you explain what a microaggression is? Yes, Danny, of course I can. Um, so a microaggression is, um, it's often a subtle, uh, indirect, um, Act of act of racism um, that can often be well intended, but but it is racist. So it could be something like to a black person, "Can I touch your hair?" Or um, uh, you know, um, you can have sexist microaggressions as well, like you you throw like a girl. Um, so Stevo, uh, that's a really good question. Is a microaggression conscious or unconscious? It can be either, and a lot of the time it is unconscious. Um, and I want to talk about that because some people say that if it's well intended, it's not racism. I 100% disagree. Um, you can you you can be you can mean you can be saying to somebody, "Oh, I want to touch your hair because your hair's so beautiful." Not okay. And listen to people when they say listen to people when they say they're offended. Um, this is the thing we have. Instead of saying, "Oh, but I'm offended, you're offended," it's about listening to that person and actually. Um, and actually trying to be better from it. Um, so so I, I think there's so, there's so much to kind of unpick here. Um, I'm going to go back into my PowerPoint just because um, I feel conscious that we're running out of time and there's a couple of things that I do want to mention uh, before we move on. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. So we went through 
um, the impact. So a lot of people said for the impact, a sense of community, um, people finding a place to belong. Yes, definitely. Oftentimes, this is the best thing that comes out of a social action project. It gives people, it gives people a space to talk about what they're going through um, in a place where other people understand, in a place where they're not going to be gaslighted in a safe space. Um, so, so with that, um, what you can, what you could do as well is if you want an ex you know, a very specific, exceptional piece of impact to come out of it, I would say go into the campaign with that um, idea in mind. So for example, um, the writers coming together and creating an anthology um, of their experience. And if you want something like this to come out of the campaign, I would say go into it with that goal in mind, um, just so you can tailor it more to that. And it could be contacting publishers and getting press attention. That could all be part of the campaign as well. Um, and yeah, so as, as people mentioned a lot of the time, the benefit that we don't really think about is that it gives people a place to belong um, and a, a, you know, a group of people to, um, as, a, and as a kind of support network, which a lot of people don't have. So I want to talk about resources. So the first one is grants. Uh, there used to be loads of charities um, doing social action grants. Um, these have dwindled quite a bit. Um, but I think depending on what your grant is, um, and I think especially with companies wanting to give back a lot more now, um, I think we're in a position where we can request things. So if you have a really solid idea, um, I would say have a look at what's out there. There's a lot of local government grants. Um, so Go Think Big used to do a lot of grants, Be Inspired, the two places I worked for, they used to do grants and things like that. I would say definitely before going into it, think about what you would need. <clears throat> and just do, do research, because everyone's research is going to be different, because everyone's project is going to be different. Um, so definitely have a look at what is out there. Um, and the other thing is, do you want to have a social action campaign, or do you want it to be a social enterprise? The difference is, a social action campaign is usually something grassroots, it's like a movement, whereas a social enterprise is something that is, ends up kind of being a business, so a business that exists to do good. Now, a lot of people I know, um, their social action campaign started it off started off as a campaign and then grew into a social enterprise. So that could be something that we, that could be definitely something that you could think about as you start to grow. Um, and when it becomes a social enterprise, you don't really need to bother with grants because it kind of funds itself. You might get funding from local businesses uh, that want you to run something. So definitely have a think about where you want it to go. Um, and the two books I would suggest, um, you going away reading if there's only two books that you read um it would be seven habits of highly effective people um and the, re the way that i heard about this weirdly is i was at a my friend ikma uh, i was at her social action event and she um she had um the, the panel was made up of young black entrepreneurs and one of them said that if you want to do something new and this I, this will always stay with me if you want to do something new you have to be someone new. So you have to change your habits. You have to completely revolutionize your workflow if you want to do something new. And I never thought about that before. I think up to that point, I was just coasting <laughs> with my life. Um, but literally I went home and I got seven habits of highly effective people. Um, it helps you with time management. It helps you focus what your goals want to be. Um, and I think especially if you want to do something like a social action campaign alongside your day-to-day -day job, uh, and or, then I would definitely suggest, I would highly suggest reading this because it really helps you to um, compartmentalize your time, uh, which is really important. I think a lot of the time we think we don't have time, but actually it's just not a priority. So it's about figuring out what is a priority. Um, I would highly recommend it if you haven't read that before. Um, and then the second book is a book by Renny Odo Lodge called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Um, and this book is, it's something that's so, it's so interesting. And it, I think it makes a lot of people feel really uncomfortable. Um, and I actually went to buy this book. So obviously there's loads of Waterstones. Where I live, it's a predominantly white area. Um, and I went to uh, Waterstones in um, Waterstones Piccadilly. And this book was, usually when a new book comes out, when it's a hardback, it literally, it's on all the shelves. Um, and so it's on all the shelves and then they'll have a book right at the front. They'll have a, a book table right at the front with just stacks of that book uh, because they want people to pick it up. So when, I, when it came out in Waterstones Piccadilly, there was this massive stack of, of these books in hardback. 
and uh, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'll pick it up when I go back home. So I went, um, <laughs> I went home, I went to go um, and pick up the book and I said to the guy at the counter, I was like, oh, do you have this book? Why I'm no longer talking to white people about race? And he said, oh, um, no, I don't think we carry that. And I was just like, well, you know, it's a brand new book. I'm sure you must have it. You should have had it delivered. And he looked up and he was like, okay, I think we have one. And it was literally on a shelf, hidden away, not even faced out on a shelf. Um, and I think this is the thing. Um, it's, it's all about, I think a lot of the times, even when we're talking about race, uh, we make it palatable. And sometimes we're so frustrated that it can't be palatable. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's too much to expect every person of color to be palatable and to, to be patient um, when they've been dealing with this their whole lives. Um, so with Renny Edo Lodge, um, with her book, she, she actually said, this is a little side note, if you are gonna buy the book, please do match fund with a, um, a charity that's doing good. So at the time it was the Minnesota Freedom Fund or um, one of the families of the victims um, that have been killed through police brutality. Um, and she said, please do donate in that way. If you can't afford it, then borrow it from a library or borrow, borrow it from a friend. And the reason she said this is because, and I think it's so imperative, um, she didn't want to profit every time a black person was killed. And I think this is something that we need to be really aware of as well. Uh, I think this is a good example going forward about how we treat matters to do with race as well. Um, so read those two books, great books, really good, really informative. Um, and just, um, you know, as a kind of inspirational um, last five minutes of this, um, I want to talk about a couple of social action projects that I worked on very closely. Um, so I worked for two years at Go Think Big, which was a charity run by the National Youth Agency and funded by O2. Um, so because we were funded by O2 at the time, we're no longer, um, that no longer is a thing. Um, but because we were funded by O2, we were able to give quite a lot of money out to um, young people as social action grants. Um, and these, I've picked out three projects that I want to talk about. Um, the first one is Stemet, run by Anne Maria Maffedon. Um, so it was uh, initially a Go Think Big funded campaign. And now she runs um, workshops all around the UK. Uh, she's running a hackathon currently. And Stemet is all, it's a social enterprise all about um, encouraging girls aged five to 22 to get into, to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and maths. And Anne-Marie actually worked at Deutsche Bank um, in, in technology and left full-time job at Deutsche Bank to pursue STEMETs full-time. Um, so this is how much she kind of believed in, believed in this and it's, it's doing amazingly. She's doing incredible things. Uh, we did a event up in Glasgow, a tech event, in Glasgow a couple of years ago at the Glasgow O2, um, which was really cool. Um, so she's doing incredible stuff at the moment. I think she's also worked with Dave the musician. And I think she's an MBE. I know that her IQ is crazy high. Her IQ is literally, like she's, she's a classified genius. Um, but yeah, she's amazing. Um, the second person is Vanessa Sanyake, who, um, is the founder of Girls Talk London. So I worked with Vanessa closely when we worked at a charity um, and she left the charity that she was working at full time to pursue Girls Talk um, full time. So, so Girls Talk is a social enterprise that connects young women with FTSE 100 businesses to empower them to develop skills and confidence to succeed in work and life via events and programmes um, and digital content. And she also is a presenter and hosts a, um, a Girls Talk online show as well. Um, so again, someone who really believed in the cause and managed to gain loads of experience from the full-time job, managed to get, you know, everything she needed from that and then, you know, used it as a springboard to do her own thing. So again, this started off as a Go Think Big Funded project. So it was something like as small as £500 and she managed to grow it into a full-time business. Uh, and finally, uh, Tito. Uh, Tito stands for Talent In, Talent Out which is, and it's a digital brokerage service that connects um, young people and it connects young people with employment. And it basically aims to, to tackle student unemployment um, and inexperience. And it was launched in 2014 by Michael Ifosa and, and Echo, who is not in this, this picture, with the help of funding from O2. Um, now I love, I love Tito. I think it's one of the most, <laughs> I, I just loved working on it. I love, Michael and Ifosa are, they're just, 
great people to talk to. They're always willing to, they're always willing to help out. Um, always willing to talk about what they want to do. They're so true to, they're so true um, to the actual fundamental cause that they wanted to go for. So Michael came up with the idea. So Michael was on the left. He came up with the idea when he graduated and he was struggling to find employment. Uh, and he started loads of different projects and networked a lot. Um, and in the process of doing this, he met a lot of young people that were in the exact same predicament that he was in. Um, so it dawned on him that young people have skill sets and ambitions that aren't being cultivated. And he realized that students coming out of university have, have an extremely limited experience of the world of work. Um, now, I, I enjoyed working with these people. So, like Every day I would come home and think, this is incredible, this is amazing. Um, it was so inspiring to see it every day. Um, and I know the young people that, that are working on their project. I mean, there's, there's countless others that I can talk about. I could literally talk, talk to you about their projects for days. Um, because these were people that, that saw something that was wrong and they had the impetus and the drive to go after it. Um, and and it's, it's amazing to see, especially if you haven't seen that before. Um, I hadn't really come from a place where I'd seen so many young people just being proactive and going for it. Um, you know, and a lot of them came from disadvantaged backgrounds as well. Um, not all of them, but, but a lot of them did. And it, it wasn't necessarily just to do with diversity, just to do with race. It was diversity in terms of disability um, as well. Um, there were a lot of projects tackling homophobia um, and, and, and other kinds of um, discrimination too. Um, so it's about seeing what problem there is that you want to kind of that you want to kind of hit. So it is very very easy to feel powerless, um, especially when in 2020 we're dealing with racism almost on a daily basis and seeing seeing things that are making us so angry every day. But we all have something to give. We all we all have something to give. It just depends on when you're able to give it. And I'm not saying. I'm not saying put your well-being to the side and go after this campaign. That's not what I'm saying at all. Focus on your mental well-being. And I, I'm saying that so, so much to um, black people and people of colour that are dealing with these, that are dealing with this. Look after your mental well-being um, cultivate that. If having a support group helps and works for you, then go for it. Um, do something to do something to look after yourselves. Um, we all have, and, and for everyone, we all have a talent or an interest or perspective on how to create change. We all have a little bit of power. And when we connect with someone else who has a little bit of power, um, we can really start to see change happen before our eyes. Um, and I just want to finish off with a quote um, that is always quoted um, when we're talking about social action uh, by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Um, thank you so much for listening today. I'm going to come back to the chat just to see, um, you know, if anyone, if anyone said anything I can address. Um, and I, I would love it if you would stay in touch. So I have a YouTube channel, Kiwi Jelly. Uh, feel free to follow me on, on everything if you feel like it would be beneficial to you. I'm not as active on Twitter, um, but I am on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Um, so, yeah, it would be great to see you all again soon. Um, this was such a great turnout. Um, I'm so... I feel so um, inspired that so many people turned up as well. Um, and yeah, I would just say, take care of yourselves. Um, and I think, you know, let's, let's try and, um, and make a difference in the small way, the small way that we can. Uh, Jana, thank you so much for putting that. Uh, just a heads up, IQ science is quite problematic and racist history. No, I, I didn't realize that. I will definitely go and educate myself on that now. Um, but yeah, I will, I will definitely have a look at that. Thanks for mentoring that. I can definitely say I've learned so much as well. Like, a, I know a person who grew up in like a white neighborhood who was white's perspective. It's like, like racism. I always knew it was like wrong and bad, uh, but it's very difficult to speak out against it when everyone around you doesn't seem to understand. Mm -hmm. So I guess a question that I have is that if you are white, how can you talk about it if you're scared of getting it wrong and also people might not understand? Um, so I, I'm not, I'm, I can't speak for every single person, but, um, but what I would say is I think a lot of people are thinking, what well, I've seen a lot, especially with celebrities and people that have huge platforms is like, oh, I need to come out and say something. Um, 
I don't think you necessarily need to come out and say something. I would say that maybe now's the time to listen, um, especially to people that are that are going that are going through with these things every day. Um, and and yeah, I think it's it's so important to educate ourselves um, to educate ourselves where we can and realize where we where we're in the wrong as well. Um, so. For example, for me, uh, being called out on this IQ thing, I think that's I think that's great. Thank you for calling me out because it means that I can go and educate myself on it. Um, but but yeah, I would say it's a it's a, it's about looking at. There's so many things in history that we look at as being positive, um, and and when we start to deconstruct that, you can't understand racism without understanding where it came from. Um, and a lot of people, I think it's about um, I think it's about actually breaking it down and thinking where we can where we can do better um so so yeah i think i think it's, it's a really good question that and i think it's a question that a lot of people have because they don't want to overstep um take care everyone thank you for, thanks and thank you Steve oh, well for before that. you all run off though we do have some opportunities or potential funding because it's all well and good teaching you about social action but you know if you haven't got any money to do it it's tough out there um, I've had plenty of funding, even from Zara, thankfully, for when she worked in those organisations to be able to build up divergent thinking and other projects. Just to give you guys a few names which are really good, these are all unfortunately only based in the UK, but there's uh, Unlimited, which is great for social entrepreneurs. Um, they have funding which goes from like a few thousand to tens of thousand very competitive, but lots of different ones, particularly community projects. There's School of Social Entrepreneurs, which um, we're currently applying for at the moment, so uh, let us in. Uh, there's Tudor Trust, they have some great funding options. Uh, the Prince's Trust, another great section of funding um, for under 30s. And Zoe, didn't you have uh, another lovely opportunity to offer? Um, yes, there is another opportunity. So there's um, an organisation called Peace First, which is a non-profit organisation helping young people around the world um, to become peacemakers. Um, they are offering a rapid response grant for young people aged 13 to 25 um, to start up their own social action project in their community. So. If you know any young people between that ages, or if you are a young person yourself who wants to create a social action project in your community, um, tackling a social injustice, then um, this is definitely uh, something that's for you. They are um, they are pausing the applications right now, um, but they will be reopening again. So I do recommend you follow them on their social medias just to keep up to date when they will reopen those applications. Um, I will be sending a link to their website so you can actually um, view it from there. Amazing. All right, guys. Well, as always, everything we said today will be sent in an email, plus the slides, plus the video recording. Um, it might take me like a little bit to get the video up because, you know, it takes time to edit. Uh, but I really hope you enjoyed this. I've learned so much. And what we like to do on here when we end is I'm going to unmute all of you, going to be utter chaos. But if you could all just say like clap and thank Zara for being an absolute star, that'd be amazing. So uh, let's give this a go. Thank you, Zara. Woo! Thanks, Zara. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Hey. Thank, Thank you, Zara. Well done. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. All right, guys. Well, stay in touch and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.